Hey, y'all. My name is Susan Sparks, and I'm the senior pastor here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. We are a diverse community brought together by faith. We hope that you enjoy our service today. The title of my sermon today is Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious Faith. <laughs> so um, you may hear some beeping in the background. We've got some construction going on next door. You know how those trucks go beep, 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 beep when they back up? Um, I was all worried that it was going to come through in the prayer and the sermon. Um, but then I realized we're talking about faith. And to back up a big truck without being able to see behind you is an act of faith. So it's a sermon illustration. <laughs> Yay. So here's the thing this morning. If I had more of an evangelical bent, honey, I would be preaching on revelations. Because everything in the headlines is all about what seems like end times. You know, last, well, last week we talked about the floods the floods in Tennessee and North Carolina and Haiti. I mean, then this week, Hurricane Ida slams through, hitting New Orleans, Louisiana, up the East Coast, and having deadly flooding in New York City. We've got the fires out west, specifically the Caldor fire that is bearing down on Lake Tahoe. The thing is, I don't really have that much of an evangelical bent, um, so I'm probably going to pass on Revelations. However, I am a preacher that loves a good Bible story. So today, given all that's going on in our headlines, I thought we should wallow in an old-timey, Old Testament, Bible-beaten Baptist kind of message 
from the book of Jeremiah. Can I have a hand waving? Amen. Whoa. Thank you. <laughs> so through Jeremiah this morning, I want to talk about the power of taking action in our faith, taking one step towards our faith. And as we said in the announcements, given all that's going on, maybe even one step seems like a big ask. But that's all I want us to think about today is just one step that we might take. So let's look at the story in our scripture. And thanks to Cheryl Sims for reading it for us today. The scripture starts out, sets the stage uh, by telling us that it's the 18th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, which calculates to be about 600 years before Jesus was born. So here in ancient Jerusalem, we are, right? And the Babylonian army is literally camped outside the gate preparing to attack. And the great prophet Jeremiah is in jail. <laughs> it's not the best of scenarios. In fact, it kind of reminds me of those old-timey silent films. Do you remember those, like black and white, where there would be a um, the bad guy and he would tie the heroine to the train track and all of a sudden you would hear in the distance the train whistle. And then everybody would start, you know, oh my gosh, hand-wringing and praying that there would be a rescue. Well, in our story today, it's set right at that train whistle moment. Jeremiah's in jail. The Babylonians are literally at the gate and everyone is praying for a rescue. But in this case, in this story, the rescue never comes, at least immediately. We know from history that the Babylonian army poured into Jerusalem, raised the city, tore down the temple, and exiled all of its citizens to Babylon. Now, the Israelites eventually did come back, but it was not for generations. And it was a, to, to a Jerusalem that didn't resemble anything that they remembered. I, I, mean, I can't help but think about the parallel in today's world right now. Those who had the flood version of the Babylonian army bearing down on them last week. Those who this week had the flood version of the Babylonian army coming in. Those in the harm's way with the Kaldor fire and the Babylonian army version of a forest fire heading for their town. I mean, many people evacuating their homes, being exiled from what they know, praying for a rescue, but the rescue in that moment and in the way that they hope may or may not happen. I mean, I don't know about you, but so far this Bible study has done nothing but depress me. But here's the great thing about Bible stories. They usually take a turn for the better. There's some wonderful turn that brings a lesson. So let's go back to Jeremiah and find that lesson. Here we are, Jerusalem, Babylonian army at the gate, the train whistle moment. And what does the great prophet Jeremiah do in this moment of crisis? He buys property, <laughs> as one would, right? He not only buys property, he buys the field that the Babylonian army is camped on. I mean, that's like somebody running up to the heroine tied to the train tracks with the train bearing down and not untying her, but asking her to marry them. I mean, you know, marrying a woman in the path of an oncoming train, buying property that an invading army is camped on. These are just outrageous acts of faith beyond long shot bets on the future. And why did Jeremiah do it? because God told him to. Now that is some seriously heavy duty faith. I mean, the only word I can think of is, that is some supercalifragilisticexpialidocious faith. Now, I bet most of you remember this word from the movie Mary Poppins and that crazy song, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, la 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 goes on. I will not subject you to the rest of it, but I bet you remember it. And the lyrics in the song talk about the magical quality of that word, how saying that crazy word can change things, can change the circumstances around you, can change people, can change the world. 
It's the type of faith that Jeremiah showed. It is the type of faith that could change the world. It was super califragilistic, expialidocious kind of faith. But here's the difference in Jeremiah and Mary Poppins. Um, obviously, there's many. Uh, let me just share this main one. In the movie, saying supercalifragilistic expialidocious, just saying the word is when things would happen. That's where the magic would happen. But in Jeremiah, saying words was not where the power was. It was taking action that made the difference. Through his faith, Jeremiah took action. He took one courageous step in the direction of his faith. He bought that field, the field on which the Babylonian army was camped. And when he did, when Jeremiah took a step toward faith, toward God, God took one giant step towards him. When the purchase was made, God said to Jeremiah, basically because of your faith and believing in me, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Through an outrageous, almost crazy act of faith, Jeremiah's purchase of that land became a covenant, a promise by God that his people would one day, one day, return home. Keep in mind, God did not say, you will return to your houses today, safe and sound. God did not say, you will turn to life exactly as you remember it. God simply said, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. In essence, at some time in the future, you will rebuild. We all face Babylonians at the gates, whether it's hurricanes or floods or illnesses or pandemics or fires or death or divorces or disappointments or financial crises. We all face Babylonians or excuse me, yeah, Babylonian army type crises at the gate. And it's in these times of crises that we must have faith, but more specifically, we must act on that faith. We must take just one step in the direction of our faith, like Jeremiah. That's what makes all the difference. Dr. King put it a, uh, another way. Dr. King said, faith is taking the first step, even though you can't see the entire staircase. Jesus said something similar in Mark eleven twenty four: Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and you, and it will be yours. Bottom line, God asks us not only to believe, but to act as if we believe. Faith is about taking the first step. Let me give us just a couple of practical modern day examples of how this might translate for us today. A couple of years ago, I counseled um, a married couple through some tough times. And to mark their commitment in those tough times, to saving that relationship, they decided to book a non-refundable vacation for the two of them a year from that moment as a statement of faith that they would, in fact, rebuild. I have a friend who's going through some hip issues and maybe facing hip replacement surgery. So what did she do? She bought a really nice pair of hiking boots <laughs> as a statement of faith that she will rebuild. I know of a family that's facing financial troubles, a load, a load of Babylonian bills at the gates. So in, in the face of having no money, they decided to open a savings account and put $1 a week in it as a statement of faith that they would rebuild. Let me give you one last example, a little closer to home. We heard from Joe and Jackie earlier in our service about um, the status of MABC and us staying virtual for a little while longer, at least the immediate future. And as we all know, this has been very hard on our community. Um, last March, 
over almost a year and a half ago now, it, the MABC leaders made a very courageous decision when the COVID virus was bearing down on our country and in our world, they made a very courageous decision to shut our on-site services off and go fully virtual. And out of an abundance of caution and love for our community, we are still virtual. However, in the face of that Babylonian army of COVID and variants and spiraling numbers, our leaders have also pulled a Jeremiah. They have committed to investing in improving our sanctuary and our worship space, like buying a field under the invading army. For example, we are upgrading our coffee hour space into a place that can be used also for Bible study and for children during our service. Our leaders are investing in a new broadcasting equipment system that will allow our beloved global family members to continue to participate live real time with us as they've been doing for the last year and a half. Even when we go on site with this new equipment, we'll be able to bring in friends from all over the world to join us with our service and offer things like call to worship or scripture. These are all acts of faith that we will return and we will re built. Faith is about taking the first step. But, it, but it's hard because we don't always know what comes after that first step. You know, there's an old saying that we've all heard, when God closes a door, God opens a window, right? Well, recently I heard a new version of it with an addition, um, and I loved it. Now, get ready, it's got a little edgy word in it, so everybody hold on, but I think it's worth sharing. When God closes a door, God opens a window, but it's hell in the hallway. Isn't that great? When God closes a door, God will open a window, but we don't know when or how that's going to happen. And in the meantime, it's hell in the hallway waiting for that window to open. Jeremiah and the Israelites were stuck in the hallway when the Babylonians took Jerusalem. The people of Louisiana and Tennessee and North Carolina and Haiti and New York and the East Coast are, were stuck and are stuck in that hallway as they recover from the floods in Hurricane Ida. The residents of Lake Tahoe are stuck in that hallway as the fires bear down on their beloved town. We will all find ourselves at one point or another stuck in that hallway, but while we wait for God to open that window, we must keep faith that the window will open, that we will find our way home, and that we will rebuild. I'll leave you with this story from a few years ago. During Hurricane Francis, one of the stronger hurricanes to hit Florida, I read about a woman who, in the face of the oncoming Babylonian-type hurricane, evacuated her home but in, in evacuating her house, she did something unexpected. She left the welcome mat out and the porch light on. She said she did that in defiance of the storm and in faith that she would return. Now, maybe not to her home as she knew it, but it was her statement of faith that she would return and she would rebuild. Perhaps we too can find a way to leave the light on in the face of an oncoming Babylonian army, to buy a field on which an invading army is camped, to just take one step in the direction of our faith, in the direction of God's promise that we will rebuild. Maybe it's something just as simple as putting one foot in front of the other and living as Jesus said as if our prayers have already been answered. It's all about the power of simple acts done in the name of faith. Friends, in the greatest crises with the most fearsome of Babylonian armies at the gate, we will go on and we will rebuild we have God's promise. Now let's just muster our faith, our super califragilistic expialidocious faith, and take one step 
in faith's direction. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenny Lindsay, your soprano. I hope you had a restful week. I did not because I have small children, but I sure hope you did. And I hope you'll join me in singing this next hymn, 61, All Things Bright and Beautiful. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, in love God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, God made their glowing flowers. together hymn number 403 a setting of first corinthians by burl red titled in remembrance of me we'll celebrate together with this song
we're so glad that you came to be with us in our service today. I hope that you remember that this is a community of faith in which you will always be welcome and you will always be considered family. And until we see you again, please hear these words for our benediction. May the majesty of the Father be the light by which you walk. May the compassion of the Son be the love by which you talk. May the presence of the Spirit be the power to light your days. And may the presence of great faith comfort you along the way. I wish you all many blessings. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Madison Avenue Baptist Church is located at 31st and Madison Avenue in New York City. Our website is www.mabcnyc.org.